Three years ago, me, my brother Billy, and his fiance Gwendolyn took on the mammoth task of restoring this stunning French chateau. At first, it was just the three of us. But since then, the whole family has moved in to help bring this place back to its former glory. And not forgetting the newest family member, baby Ernest. We do everything ourselves, from fixing the leaky roof, managing the vast 60 acre estate, to restoring the grand interiors back to the way they were a hundred years ago. It's not always easy, but that's what makes life in a place like this interesting. My name's Michael, and I'm going to be showing you what it's like to live, work, and play at Chateau de la Bamignée. Well, hello everyone and welcome back. Well, what's happened uh, since you last saw me? It's been a quiet couple of weeks at the Chateau. Not really much been happening, but uh, we have made some really good progress on the gardener's cottage. So I'll go and show you that in a bit, but first I'm gonna get a coffee. It's a lovely day outside, the sun's shining and um, time to start some work, I guess. There we go, fancy machine. Right, well, Sean's just bought something to show me today, and I'm actually quite interested in buying it. Sean, um, you have an Etsy shop, don't you? I've got an Etsy shop, yeah, with a few things in it. And he sells a lot of copper cookware, and um, he's bought this in to show me. Um, can you tell everyone what it is? Well, it's a door beer. Uh, it's an old French pot that used to cook on mainly open fires, but uh, later on they developed them so they can go into uh, smaller ranges and things like that. And MP. Come and look and look at this, look. <laughs> Just a tiny little detail. My initials are on it. Michael Petherick. Michael Petherick. We've got an initial there, an initial there. So the lid fits the base. And they were made with an extra rim round there to make them hermetically sealed. Yeah. So that when they cooked things like meat and that held the moisture in. Yeah. So uh, basically a, a stew or a brazier they call it, a stew pan. There I'll you go. Quite interested in buying that <laughs> off you, Sean. You can test run that, no problem. Because you don't normally see them with your initials on, so. Um, so what's this for, Dad? This is for the stud work in, in the bedrooms upstairs. What, in your cottage? In my cottage, yeah. And, you... um, you're going to want some of this next door as well. You do yours. Yeah, I'll probably need some of that, yeah. yeah I'm just going to throw it up there now and uh, start... Um, the stud work up. I've done some of the stud work up, but uh, there's a load more to do. Yeah. You'll have to show everyone what you've been doing in there. Well, Give us a little tour. Now with us. We're just going up in there with some of this timber. You can have a, you can have a look. All right. I right, see. So put all the windows in. Yeah, all the windows are in. Yeah. Now this stuff's all new. All this wood round here. Yeah, this is uh, stud work. You put insulation behind that. Put none of the timbers across here like that. Yeah. All the way through, so it's the same width as the as the uh, plasterboard. And then we put the insulation in first before we put the plasterboard on. Yeah. All in back of the as rock wall. See, so look at that. You can see that bit of wood there. Yeah. That bit of wood there is the roof the of door. the cottage next door. Yes. So where I wanted to put where I wanted to put my doorway, which was going to go into the little what I was going to have as an ensuite next door. Actually, because I didn't do the measurements properly, it actually, if I'd started knocking through the wall, it would have come through into here. <laughs> and it wouldn't have even been the same no, floor height as well. It's quite low, so yeah. it would have been below the floor level. So glad I didn't start knocking through the wall. Got all this timber in now. We're, we're putting this all through here. Oh, yeah, putting the ceiling up. Put the ceiling up. Yeah. And I've got to finish the stud work around, way around. So this iron bar here that goes Stay through through the, through the, completely through the room, it goes onto the, the wall outside and it's actually bracing that outside wall to stop it from it's a cross like that. yeah it's a cross on it to stop it from falling over Both ends. so unfortunately it can't be removed so it's going to have to be in the rooms but i think if you paint it up it look quite nice you can really hang, nice, your, yeah. hang your washing on it dad so how many bedrooms are you going to have up here then two two bedrooms one 
One from there. Yeah. Down there. Uh, and an ensuite here. Yeah. Where this one under is. Yeah. And another bedroom here. Yeah. And an ensuite. Ensuite here. Oh, so you put like the little windows in for the ensuite, and the, the big suites, the yeah. big windows are for the uh, bedrooms. Bedrooms, yeah. It's going to be quite a lot of space up here. Yeah, it's going to be big, big bedrooms. Yeah, yeah. So this floor here is completely new. When uh, Billy and Gwen bought the chateau, this um, this floor in here had actually collapsed into the to the room below. So there was no floor in here, so it all had to be replaced. So Dad's put this new floor down. It's quite solid. There's a new, was it like a steel RSJ that goes yeah, through? Yeah, right through. Yeah. Here somewhere. Under here, yeah, I think, yeah. in the centre here. That's yeah. where the old beam used to be. But it was a huge oak beam and it rotted at both ends where it touched the wall. So it just collapsed under its own weight. And this is where all the, you know, the Tomet tiles, the terracotta tiles yeah, the that I'm going to have in the cottage, yeah, yeah. they were all in here on the floor. But obviously oh. when the floor collapsed, they all dropped into the room below. Yeah. But most of them were rescued, so rescued. they're going to get used next door in the gardener's cottage. So show us what you're going to do downstairs, Dad. Well, this is all going to be replastered. Yeah. We've got to put uh, plasterboard light through the ceiling. Yeah. Uh, got to put uh, electrics in first for the down lights. Yeah. Um, this is a new fireplace that I, that I built. Well, this was already here, but um, I put yeah. the bricks in the back in a new hearth. So these are old bricks that were you found here? Yeah, these come out of here. There was a separating wall here. And yeah. They used that as a bedroom. Oh, right, okay. That was a bedroom. Yeah. Uh, and then this this was our kitchen. Okay. A little small kitchen with a little cooker here with a flue going up through there. Yeah. And there was a door into there. But what we're doing now, we're making this just a, a lot bigger kitchen. Yeah. Plus a dining area here. So you're going to have a kitchen and diner. Yeah. There'll be a bit of a step down into the into the yeah. dining room. Really small step there down into the dining room. Yeah, and then through here is going to be your living room. Living room. Yeah, and right through. And these tiles here that you put, Dad actually built this half. These tiles are the same tiles that we're going to be using in the gardener's cottage. The same ones. So you can see here, you've put. Is that is that like lime lime, lime mortar, mortar that you put between them? I use silica sand. To so it's nice and fine, you get yeah. a nice, uh, decent joint. Well, they look nice in here, they look nice next door as well. Yeah, once they're sealed, yeah. cleaned off, and then seal them with a... You can buy a modern sealant, but yeah. they used to use a mixture of linseed oil and turps right. to seal them. So yeah. I might use that, or I might try and find a, a modern, something that can be mopped as well. Because they're quite they porous. The them once they're... Yeah, they go and they get a nice, and apparently you can, if you get the linseed and, and the oil, you can polish them as well. That's like, right. So you buff them up so they've got a shine on them. So Dad's just going to show you his uh, new stove that he bought. Where did you get it from? Was it England? I mean, yeah, from up the river, it does. It's bringing 30 radiators. So it's uh, like a log burning, like a wood burning stove, but actually it's got a boiler in the back. So it's going to do the central heating for the whole building. It might be able to do the cottage next door yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I do, when I come through, I've got to come through. Yeah. Through here. Yeah. I'm going to radiate over there. And what I'll do, I'll put the two pipes up and through into yours. Yeah, because that, if that, yeah, look, yeah. the wall of the cottage ends just there. So yeah. if you went through that wall yeah. with the two pipes, it'll go straight into the yeah, cottage. Yeah, you can go anywhere you want in there then. With, yeah. Uh, once you've got the two pipes in and out. Well, I probably won't have more than, I'll probably have two radiators, small radiators in the bedroom under each window, one in the downstairs and probably one in the bathroom. So that's like four radiators for the yeah. whole cottage. So good. And that means you haven't got to pay for uh, gas or no, oil or anything. You just... You've got so much wood there in the forest. Yeah. Enough to last us a hundred years down there. Yeah. So <laughs> be able to heat the place for free. So what we're doing, just moving the stuff back over to the guest house because finally we're getting our first paying customers in the guest house for this year. So we need to get it all ready for them. So we're just putting the uh, tables and chairs back so that they have somewhere to sit and enjoy that lovely view. All the high range. It's weird, they all look purple this year. They're normally they're with like different colours, but yeah. hedges all been trimmed by Billy.
So what's this then? Check me pockets on the way out. You're talking about <laughs> copper? <laughs> yeah, we're having a copper moment. I've actually taken some of it upstairs, actually. I've been using some of it. It all needs a good polish. Actually, where's the um, where's the jam one? There was a, like a one like this, but it was thicker. Um, I'm sure, it's somewhere. It's I'd, somewhere. It's so really I'd, heavy. I want to make some um, blackberry jam today. Like oh, yeah, spot yeah. There. Actually, this is it's, an old it's actually my one. I bought this. It's uh, it's an old whisk whisking bowl for whisking eggs or whatever. Coolie pool. What do you call it? Cool de pool. Cool de pool. Something like that. It's yeah. like an egg, doesn't it? Look. French accent. It's for mixing egg whites. And yeah, that. that's it. And there's no, there's no uh, base on it, so you have to just hold it in your arm like that and uh, and whisk with the other hand. But it's um, apparently copper is the best thing for whisking eggs egg because whites. egg whites because uh, something in the copper stops the like the foam and the eggs from collapsing. Mm. So that's the chemistry, best thing. Chemistry there's chemistry in that. There's, <laughs> so there's a there's method in the madness. So at least I do own one or two pieces of copper. Not a lot though. Actually, these are mine as well. Look, they're all poshers for doing laundry. So you would have uh, put your laundry in hot water and soap in a some sort of container, and then you would have just done like that and poshed poshed away. I don't mind me going through it. Yeah, Where's yeah, you been? Yeah. <laughs> a bit forward here. I do like copper. Keeping the sweet shop. That's Vildeo, that one, I think, isn't it? Well, it says. Uh, I'm <laughs> that at the market. Well, we had one like that that was Vildeo. Slightly hammered. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's got the sticker yeah. on it. Look. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've got a few uh, products with that sticker. They're still going now, I think. That yeah. BXP. Nice old coal yeah, scuttle nice. there. Yeah. Oh, quite a lot of copper. Is there more in the cupboards as well? Yeah. Oh, look at the size of that pan in there. That's huge. Let's have a look. Yeah, I think I've used, used it a few times. Something. That's huge, that one. You've got a nice tall one as well, haven't you? Like with yeah. a lid on it. I think it's in the in the room in there. What's that? Brazed seam where they form the, oh, yeah. the shape of the pot. It's funny, they actually... Um, they solder it with, with um, brass and yeah, not copper. Yeah, it's, it's molten, molten brass to make the... So it's stronger, so, yeah. stronger yeah. than copper, yeah. yeah. It really is yeah, an art, art form. Wow. But uh, a lot of the times you'll also yeah. see a compass point in the base of a pan. You can't yeah. see it because they wear out over time. What mm. it is, is where they measure out with a compass. Yeah. Uh, they sort of lay it out and it's sort of like a geometrical thing. Where yeah. they cut and fold. A bit like origami and copper, really. Yeah. <laughs> this one's got all of the seams on it as well. That's uh, it. There's yeah. a seam running down there. Brass and all around the bottom as well, so it was all joined from different pieces. Some of these are formed over a wooden form or an iron form, just yeah. by uh, hammering and planishing the copper after. Yeah. Uh, the planishing strengthens uh, the copper and increases the heat con conductivity. Is that a shillelagh? It's a shillelagh, yeah. <laughs> Irish shillelagh, shillelagh yeah. Oh, that's, for, that's for cracking skulls, apparently. It's an antique. <laughs> that's for working faster. Yeah. <laughs> a persuader. All right, let's move this washing machine then. So what are we doing, Mike? Oh, we're taking this washing machine back to the guest house because there isn't one in there. And obviously, if people want to wash their clothes, they need one. So we have to try and get this thing out of the basement and across to the, uh, across to the other building. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Oh, not too bad. Don't break your back, just take it easy. Says me holding a camera.
very clean in here. <laughs> Better not make a mess then. Oh, it's coming off the Well, the guest house all been cleaned. We've got our first guests of the season arriving. Obviously, because of the travel restrictions in Europe, we haven't had any guests or any income at the chateau from the guest house. So. These are our first customers and the whole place has been cleaned. So we're just doing a few little bits to spruce it up, make sure it's perfect. And um, yeah, hopefully they'll enjoy their stay. Actually, you've probably seen this guest house before because I did a tour of it in probably my fourth or fifth video. But there you go. Let's go and see what Sean's up to. What are you up to, Sean? <laughs> a bit of painting. <laughs> Sorting out the dirty fireplace. <laughs> Fresh coat, I think. It's not exactly the right colour, but we don't have the original. So we've got this one, which is close enough. But it should look good when it's done. Oh, someone's back. Yeah. The car, oh, postman. Somebody just sent me this lovely book from England. It's the Beatrix Potter Country Cooking Book. Well, this is going to come in handy, definitely. Wow, look at that. Which one's Beatrix Potter? Is that her? Oh, that's Beatrix Potter. Look, outside her cottage in the Lake District. I might be going there soon, so uh, keep your eyes peeled for future videos. Wow, look at that. Who's it from? Michael, I thought this would come in handy at your new cottage, Janet Nash. Well, thank you very much, Janet. I don't normally open presents on camera, but seeing as this just arrived and I have the phone out, there it is. Thank you very much. Well, we've had some slight success with the gardener's cottage. You may notice that just behind me, these cracks, you can no longer see daylight through them. So I'll take you outside and I'll show you what's happened. So there you go. The cracks in the wall are gone. Obviously the lime pointing that's been put in there is a little bit lighter than the original, but it's all glued back together and the pins weren't necessary. So it wasn't necessary to stitch it because the lime mortar is uh, sufficient enough to hold it all together. So just have a look up there. It's all been done all the way down all the way along here. You go up there, you can see all those cracks that have been filled right the way to the top and right the way to the roof line. And if you come around here as well, the bit underneath the chimney has all been redone as well. So there you go. Well, I actually can't take any credit for the pointing at all. Uh, Dad and Sean, they took over and they did all of it. So um, there you go. So something that I didn't do, but I'm actually glad that you can see all of the new bits there. I'm actually glad that I didn't do it because if I did it wrong, you know, the building could still be in danger of collapse. So um, the professionals did it, um, but I did watch what they did. So maybe I'll have a go uh, in the future. Um, obviously this stuff is structural. The front of the cottage does re need redoing. Um, because the the pointing on there is, is obviously it's not it's not perfect so it would be nice to actually redo the whole front of the building but obviously that's just cosmetic so it's not important we don't have to do that now but something I would like to do in the future is to redo the whole front of it because if I show you here let's go and have a little look some of this just here and if you can see uh, it's quite difficult yeah this is not lime there sorry this is not lime mortar this is uh concrete so um but it's okay it's keeping the water out and it's quite strong it's not uh coming out obviously it doesn't look 
the way it should. So that will have to be chipped out at some point and redone, but this, this is fine because, yeah, so that's the outside of the cottage pretty much done now. We need to put the ridge tiles on the roof. They're still missing. Obviously, there's a little gap between the top two sets of tiles on both sides where they meet. So they need re uh, putting on, actually. We've got those somewhere. Um, that's a job for the cherry picker. Uh, I'll get Billy to, to do that at some point. Um, so now, now we sort of fix the outside of the building. It's about time we continued inside the building. So not really a lot I can do at the minute because the funds from the GoFundMe still haven't gone into my bank account. And I'm not sure why. Um, so... I will have to contact them, I guess. Um, but it is being held by them, so um, uh, hopefully I'll get it soon. <laughs> because otherwise, there's not going to be a lot happening in here. So, um, but at least we've got the new concrete floor, the the cracks in the building, they've all been fixed. Big, big, big jobs. They've been done now. So I guess the interior now is just a case of you know fitting it out we're gonna you know like we've got to get new floorboards and all of that sort of stuff but i mean i've talked about this loads and loads of times before so i'm not going to keep repeating myself because i don't want you to get bored so <laughs> um but we're on track we're on track a bit slower than i expected i wanted it to move a bit faster than this but um the stuff that we've done so far you know it's just it's not been too expensive, um, but it has cost money. And um, the stuff that's gonna, that needs to happen now is gonna cost a lot more. Um, so I'm keeping it going. <laughs> so all of my wonderful patrons um, from Patreon um, and the uh, ad revenue from YouTube, the people that watch the adverts, that has been paying for this so far. Um, and the, um, the GoFundMe will pay for the rest of it. Um, so um, thank you to everyone that just contributes in any way, whether it's just watching an advert or, or signing up to Patreon to, to help continue making these videos and, and to help fund projects like this. Um, just want to say thank you because I feel like I don't say thank you enough and that's very important. So um, this is all down to you guys. Yeah, um, I'm just trying to think what I can show you today because... There's not really a lot going on now. We're just um, the the line pointing on the side of the building that is still setting, so we just let that need that to do its thing. Um, nothing happening in here this week, unfortunately. But what can I show you? I have an idea. There is a historic monument just beyond the edge of the chateau's grounds, actually, um, and it used to be part of the estate. A long, long time ago, before all of the extra land was sold off. I mean, this chateau used to have so much land with it. It used to have, uh, I think, at least 15 farms that were part of the estate. They obviously were all sold off years ago. Um, so it's just the what what's left. Um, but just beyond the border of the chateau's estate, which used to be part of the chateau, it is a historic monument laying in a field. And you would never know it's there it's quite important and it's actually due to this historic monument that um this the land around the chateau is actually protected so that means they can't build um an industrial estate they can't build a motorway through here they can't put big wind turbines up it, it has to be protected and that's because of this so i'm probably going to take a little walk now and show you the um pierre de saint guillaume Sangu, my French is not very good, but it basically means the stone of St. William. And um, there's quite an interesting story behind it. So let's go and take a look. So if we go down the driveway, away from the chateau, and there is just in the background, we're gonna leave the property. That doesn't happen very often in this vlog. So that is the chateau there. And this is the wall garden. There's a little gate there, a second gate. It's not the one next to the gardener's cottage. It's a different one. This would have been used to access the fields here. This gate wasn't actually here. This was, um, even this piece of wall wasn't here. That's been added. I think it was just a fence along here. 
but um, this door would have been how people from this um, the chateau got out and accessed this land. And I don't know if you can see, just over there is a little circle of trees. That is a Second World War bomb crater. And that is where a um, British pilot during the Second World War was flying over, over here, over the chateau, well, towards the chateau, and was uh, being chased by a German pilot. And he um, was sh shot at the plane, the English plane. Uh, I've probably said this story before, so sorry if you've heard that one before. But yeah, I want to just show you where it is. So the plane was flying over, um, shot at by a German pilot, and the guy had to um, ditch. He had a bomb on board. He had to ditch the bomb. Um, and he obviously didn't want to um, crash land with the bomb still on his plane. Obviously, that wouldn't have been pretty for him. Um, so he dropped the bomb. <whistles> Ooh, it there. Sorry, a bit of a wonky line. So he dropped his bomb here. And there's a huge crater, which obviously now they can't use that for farmland. So um, it's just kind of fenced off because it's um, not usable. So what happened is uh, the bomb went off, the shockwave blew all the windows out of the chateau, um, blew the door off of the gardener's cottage. It didn't destroy the gardener's cottage, but obviously I think the cracks may have started back in the 1940s. Um, as a result of that. Uh, I mean, if it had the power to blow all of the windows out of the west wing of the chateau um, and blow the door off of the gardener's cottage, um, I think it may have uh, caused a bit of a crack in the wall. Um, that's quite possible. And this all, this, um, this wall, this is part of the wall garden just here. This has all been repaired um, probably not that long ago. I mean, they've actually put a new, a new sort of top thing on it to, to repair it. it's all been repointed that must have been a huge job um, that was done by a previous owner so we didn't have to do that thankfully um, because to have a crumbling wall around a wall garden um, just another really expensive job that you really don't want to do so here you know we will get there eventually this is part of the chateau's estate um, more fields we don't really go here very often we let the farmer cut it for hay twice a year and he just takes the hay. Right, so we'll continue our walk down the lane, away from the chateau. Just wide open countryside here. I think there's probably more cows than humans in this uh, department. Hello. Right, so just down this lane is where the stone is. And I don't know if you can see, there in the distance is the chateau. There's some lovely cows. So this is the farm. So this used to be owned by the chateau. No longer though. You actually can see it's still got um, very similar brick arched windows in the barn just here. May have been built at the same time. Uh, this actually was up for sale recently for something ridiculous like, I don't know if it was about 50,000 euros or something. You don't get much land with it though that's probably um why it didn't sell but yeah, it'd be quite nice but just down this lane here is where we are heading so not far to go now so here we are you may say to yourself where is the historic monument ah, well blink and you'll miss it it is actually this this stone. You can see it's got some unusual marks on it. So let me just take a seat on this uh, 7,000 year old historic monument and talk about it. So in this stone, there are these, I describe them as like smoothed out wells. There's one here, one there, uh, one there, and one there. Uh, also, if you come up here, can you just see here, there are these grooves that run all the way through the stone here and here, now this stone was used thousands of years ago by Stone Age people to sharpen their tools. Now, once upon a time before the days of metal axes, um, great, isn't it? I've uh, just arrived here um, at the most important point I need to speak, you know, dialogue. I need to tell you about this uh, amazing um, historic stone and the wind's picked up so you probably can hear on camera it's probably a bit 
um, bad sound quality. Uh, so I'm just gonna sit here for a bit and hope that the wind drops. It looks like it's getting a bit stormy, so we might have some problems here. Um, need to get a uh, windproof microphone very soon. Well, I can't film because of the wind. Um, there's probably still about four or five more hours of daylight, so um, if the wind drops, I will walk back here and I will explain uh, what this stone is all about and why it's here and what it was used for and the legends that surround it and how it is connected to a saint. That's why it's called the Stone of St. William. St. William Firmatus, actually, to be precise. Um, but I can't really s explain it now because of the um, terrible uh, wind. Um, you can probably hear it now, so. Uh, I'm going to come back and um, try and do uh, some filming then. So, until then, let's hope the wind drops. Okay, well, the wind has finally dropped, but it's 10 o'clock at night. So I'm gonna rush back to the stone now. And if there's enough light, I'm gonna tell you all about it. So um, I'm gonna go there now, uh, but I'll spare you the journey because you've already seen that. And hopefully we'll be able to tell you the story of the stone of St. William.
Are you ready to begin the story of the Pierre de saint guillaume the stone of St. William? Oh, it's getting quite spooky. Let's go back 7,000 years, back to the Stone Age. Now, most of France was covered in forest back then, but in order for people to inhabit this area, they had to make clearings in this vast forest so that they could have a place to graze animals and, and grow crops. And in order to cut down these uh, trees, these ancient trees from these ancient forests, they needed axes. Now remember, this is the Stone Age. So there were no metal axes. All they had were stone axes. And how do you sharpen a stone ax? Well, you come to the stone of St. William. So back in the Stone Age, people didn't have metal axes, obviously, to cut down these vast forests to make clearings to live in. So they needed to import special stones like flint um, from abroad. And obviously they would not be sharpened. So when the people received them, they would need somewhere to sharpen these stones to make axes. Now, most areas like this would have had a special stone. Uh, hello cows. Most of these areas would have had a special stone that everyone would have come to, to sharpen their axes. And this was one of those very stones. So this stone, the Pierre, uh, the Pierre de Saint Guillaume, the stone of St. William was imported and it's a type of sandstone and it's perfect for polishing rocks. So I'm just gonna show you now. On the stone, you can see these grooves and there's quite a few of them. There's one, one big one here and another one here. And these would have been used to sharpen the stones. Now I've got a stone here. This is not a flint. So this is not the kind of stone that you want to be sharpening. And also this is a registered historic monument and it's very valuable. So I'm not going to actually sharpen this stone in it, but you can see it would have run along these grooves and they would have had different grooves for different levels of sharpening. And then you would have these bowls here. So you've got a bowl here, a bowl here, and another one here. And they would have been used for sharpening the side of the blades of these stones. And you can see this has been used for thousands and thousands of years because this very, very hard stone has worn down quite a lot. And you can see all of these special grooves all along here where people would have sharpened their stones and here where they would have gone round in circles to try and sharpen the sides. Um, and that is how in the Stone Age, you create an ax to chop down a tree. Now fast forward to a thousand years ago. There once was a man called William Fermatus, and he was a canon, and he lived in the area of Tours. And he was a very, very rich man, uh, and he was obviously quite high up in the religious circles, being a canon. He decided to give up his um, riches and his luxurious life to become a hermit. So he left everything behind, and he came to live in this area, in the forests, and he didn't have a lot of contact with people from the outside world. Uh, he lived a solitary life and he prayed a lot. And the legend says that he could tame any animals. So he could call the birds down from the trees and they would land on his hands. And uh, any kind of animals would come to him and would not be scared of him, where they'd be scared of normal people. And one day there was a very, very naughty wild boar that was damaging people's crops. So they called William Fermatus. And the legend says that he walked into the field with the crops and he found this wild boar that was destroying all of the fields of crops. He led it by the ear into the forest and he asked this wild boar to stay where it was all night alone and that it was not to move until it realized what it had done and how bad it was. And the legend uh, was obviously, the legend carried through centuries, almost a thousand years. That brings us to the death of St. William. Now the legend says that William Fermatus was um, captured by marauders and he was brought to this stone and he was murdered on the stone. They laid him on the stone and they killed him. And the people say that the depressions in the stone, one here for his head, you can't really see it, each for his shoulders and his arms, and then here, and then these for his legs. Now, I can't show you here because it's too dark. 
And hopefully from the footage earlier, let's take away my stone here. Hopefully from the footage earlier, I will be able to show you that there are actually red, you can see, you probably can't see it. There are red stains on this stone. And I don't mean like the iron oxide orangey stains. These are quite red. And this is said to be the blood of St. William because when it touched his stone, apparently it stained the stone for eternity and it could never be washed off. So that is when they realized that he was someone quite special. Now, we don't know if these are actually bloodstains or if they're some sort of natural thing in the rock, but that's what the legend says and we're gonna go with it. And it is said that this stone, if you can see it, it's getting very dark now. This stone was said to be able to cure a fever. So anybody who was sick with a fever was brought to this stone and laid upon it. And apparently they were healed from laying on this rock. Um, and I don't think it gets used very much these days, but if I ever am dying of a fever, I will give it a try. And also it is said that the devil would capture children and bring them to this very stone to eat them. So on that note, thank you for watching and I'll see you next week. Night, night. <laughs>